Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to Professor Eugene Polzi um, from the Niels Bohr Institute and the University of Copenhagen. And uh, Professor Eugene Polzi has been leading um, the effort uh, in quantum optics and quantum information there and has created one of the you know, top research institutions in this area there. And he kindly came to uh, visit us and tell us about the important interface between atoms and photons for quantum information purposes. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, let's just get started. So um, I will be discussing very specific part of the uh, quantum technologies, quantum information science, and that would deal with the interface between light, photons, and rather macroscopic objects. Those macroscopic objects for most of the talk will be large ensembles of identical atoms. But hopefully in the end of the talk I will also have a chance to tell you that very similar interface approach can work for a truly macroscopic object like a membrane which can be a mechanical oscillator and interact with light at the quantum level. So um, a bit of history. When I came to Denmark from California back more than 15 years ago, the dominant trend in quantum inter interfaces was a single atom and photons. And as you can imagine, if you want to have a very efficient interaction of an atom with a photon, you essentially have two options. One is you have to take the mode of the photon and focus it down to the size of the atom, right? Because in optics, if you have a beam of light, and this beam of light has a certain cross-section, the atomic cross-section is like one micron. So if you put a single photon in this big cross-section and your atom has a cross-section of one micron, there is very little chance of interaction. So what you do is you take a powerful objective lens and you focus light down, hopefully, to a micron. But focusing light down to a micron is difficult. And also, at that point, light becomes not exactly a transverse wave, so you, you have limits at this point. Another alternative with a single atom is you take this atom and you put it between two mirrors. So you make an optical resonator. In this case, light comes in, bounces many times between those mirrors, and has a much higher chance to interact with this atom, despite the fact that the mode volume can be large. So that was the trend which was pursued by many people and uh, was very successful. But what we wanted to do is to find an alternative. And the alternative that we proposed was, let's take a lot of atoms and do the interface in a way where atoms contribute to a superposition. So, for instance, imagine that I have a photon. Imagine that my photon is totally absorbed in the atomic ensemble. That means that one of the atoms of the ensemble got excited. But I don't know which one, if I do it right. And then I have a superposition state with all the power of quantum superpositions. So this was the approach that we started many years ago, and this is the approach that we are continuing nowadays. So the, the beginning was really like I so told you. We did it with squeezed light. Um, if you know what squeezed light is, that's good. If you don't, never mind. It's light with some quantum properties. And we took this light with quantum properties and we sent it into atoms and we demonstrated that if light is completely absorbed, then the quantum properties of light are 
imposed on the atoms. And uh, people afterwards have extended this approach to the so-called electromagnetically induced transparency, EIT, maybe you heard about it. But uh, this is not going to be the main part of my talk. So this was sort of the resonant interaction. And then approximately 14 years ago, something together with uh, Peter Zoller and uh, Ignacio Sirac, we started looking at the so-called dispersive interactions. And I will tell you a lot about those dispersive interactions. So the dispersive interaction, the, the most famous example of a dispersive interaction is the index of refraction of the medium. You send light into the medium, and because of the interaction with the atoms of the medium, light gets phase delayed because the speed of light becomes different. So dispersive interactions are characterized by no absorption or almost no absorption, but at the same time there is some phase interaction which is important. So I will tell you today about using those dispersive interactions and this is kind of the pictorial representation of a quintessential experimental situation. So imagine that you have atoms and imagine those atoms have two possible ground states. That one and this one. This, those could be, for example, two different magnetic sublevels. If you put an atom in a magnetic field, then the spin of the atom can have different orientations in this magnetic field, and therefore the energies could be different. Or, for instance, it can be two hyperfine components of the atom, where the electron and nuclear spin have, for instance, opposite directions. What's important here is that the energy splitting between those two levels is nowhere close to optics. It's rather in the megahertz up to gigahertz range. And what's also important is that there is no spontaneous emission between those two levels, or almost no, because those are essentially optically forbidden transitions. So that means that if you create some coherent superposition of those two levels, then it can leave for a long time. And I will show you the experiments where this thing lives for a fraction of a second. And this time defines you the quantum memory time and all those beautiful advances. So those two are the ground substates of the atom, which are used to store our quantum bits to create entanglement. What are those guys? Those are some excited states. So you need light, right? So you send light, for example, in this transition, and it also will couple to this transition. So for those of you who know a little bit of atomic physics, if I have a spin one-half system, then it can have only two projections in the magnetic field, Let's assume that in the excited state, I also have a spin one-half system, so it's a little bit of a toy atom, but that's okay. And then depending on the polarization of light, light will interact on different transitions. So for example, this and that will be the so-called pi polarization. So pi polarization of light is the polarization which goes in the direction of quantization. So if my quantization axis is the magnetic field, then polarization of light, which looks like that, will be called pi. On the other hand, those transitions, and this one, which require a change in the angular momentum of one, and one is exactly 
the angular momentum of a circularly polarized photon. So if the photon is circularly polarized like that, then it will be the so-called sigma plus polarization, it will be that one. And if it's circularly polarized like this, it will be sigma minus polarization, and that would be that one. So now you know that depending on polarization of light, I can actually excite different transitions. Please also notice that those two polarizations, they only have the projection on this direction, right? It's, it's like that. So, if I, for example, send light in this direction, then this component of light will be pi polarization, and those two components will include both sigma plus and sigma minus. This will be more or less the experimental situation that I will refer to. So, light will be propagating in this direction. Okay, so we're uh, almost there. And notice, please, that those arrows, they don't hit the resonance. And this is essentially the statement that I don't want much of absorption. I want my interactions to be essentially dispersive. And what it means here is that if I initiate all my atoms here, this I can do by optical means as well, called optical pumping. And then I have the classical strong light coming in this polarization. Then there is a chance that there will be an off-resonant scattering, and the photon will be scattered, now in the polarization orthogonal to the input polarization. So I come up with only this polarization, but I will have quantum photons scattered in the orthogonal polarization. So think about it. If I have electrical field, electromagnetic field, which is polarized like that, and then I add to it something in this polarization, that essentially would mean that my polarization changes. And change of the polarization is an off-resonant effect of the dispersive type, right? I am not absorbing photons, I'm just scattering them from one mode to the other mode. Uh, Professor, I want to ask you, uh, when there is a magnetic field you have, and uh, we can also assume with respect to the electric field polarization, can, can we, with respect to the electric field? Electric field. Electric field. When the both fields are present, right. the, both, the, both are perpendicular to one and another, then we call that field a cross field. But if we have a that cross field, then the both the effects of the electric force and the magnetic force cancel one another. Then how we can get this field? Mm, I need to think a little bit. So, typically, um, we need to understand the following, that the field that creates this splitting, if this is what you're talking about, it's a DC, it's a constant magnetic field. There is no electrical field. Um, so, classical polarization can lead to the scattering of a quantum photon in this polarization. So, what would this scattering lead to? We have created a quantum photon in this polarization, and we have created a single atomic excitation. So, in the Hamiltonian, this will be the creation operator for a photon, and creation operator for an atomic excitation. And this Hamiltonian, you should know if you are interested in quantum information science, because this is an entangling Hamiltonian. In many cases, when you look in the literature and you are interested in an entanglement, the simplest Hamiltonian that you can use 
for entanglement between the two physical systems will be that one. Sometimes it's called parametric Hamiltonian because it actually came from the optical parametric down conversion. The difference between this and optical parametric down conversion is that in this system you have entanglement between a photon and an atomic excitation now stored in the memory. So that's one process, but there could be also another process. Imagine that I come with the light here, which contains also some energy, a photon. Then, of course, I can take this photon and scatter it into the strong field. So this photon will disappear and the atomic excitation will appear. This is this part of the Hamiltonian, which is now annihilation of a photon and creation of the, magnet of the atomic excitation. So what is this good for? This is good for the exchange of the quantum states between two systems. And in quantum uh, information science, this is often referred to a beam splitter Hamiltonian. You know, a beam splitter, you have one input mode, another input mode, and the two output modes. And this Hamiltonian tells you that you can come with one mode and then the two modes will be swapped. So, in atomic physics, it is possible to find conditions where those coefficients can be either different or the same. Therefore, this looks like the most general form of a bilinear Hamiltonian for the interaction between the two systems. So, with this Hamiltonian at hand, you can play all those endless games of entanglement, teleportation, quantum measurement, whatnot. And this is what we've been doing for the past 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, well, the reason is that this is done in the so-called linear approximation, where I have a strong field, and I can linearize everything with this strong field. So if, for example, I would have a situation where this kind of process could happen using one photon here and one photon here, then it would be a very different ball game. Then it will be really a quadratic Hamiltonian in the light and maybe linear Hamiltonian in the atom. So it is not the entire story. And obviously, quadratic and cubic Hamiltonians are very interesting and very exciting. But if you are interested in this part of the story, then maybe we can discuss it later. Because you can actually add this type of nonlinearity to the system by making a measurement. If you make a measurement counting a photon, then it has been shown that photon counting is equivalent to the nonlinear interaction. So, now I need to tell you about my atomic spin ensembles and how you can mathematically represent them so that those Hamiltonians can be actually obtained in, in reality. So, this is a little bit more realistic situation and, uh, well, it's a cesium atom. So, cesium is one of the alkali atoms, so it goes hydrogen, helium, and uh, then whatever goes third. I forgot what goes third, but then it's potassium and sodium and rubidium and cesium. So, um, those are atoms where outside of the closed shells, you only have one electron. So it's a very pretty system because you have just a single electron around and the spectrum is simple. It's also nice because cesium has very high vapor pressure at room temperature. So in Californian sun, cesium melts actually if you just hold it in the sun.
And in Portuguese sun it will melt as well, I suppose. Not in Danish sun. <laughs> you need to keep it always in vacuum because it's an extremely chemically active. It has one electron pretty far away, so it's happy to mate with anybody who is interested. So that would be oxidization. So you need to put it in vacuum, but that's no problem. And then you can have at room temperature a very good optical density of those atoms. And just to give you dessert first, if you want to have an efficient interaction between a photon and an ensemble of atoms, then the one parameter that you want to enhance is called the optical depth. And this is essentially very simple. You want to make sure that if you were working on resonance, if you were working on resonance, if your light would be on resonance with the transition, then all those photons will be absorbed. So the optical depth is defined If you have light with the input intensity like that, and the output intensity is like this, then this is the optical depth. So you want this D to be large for on resonant light. And then you go off resonant and you have very beautiful and strong of resonant interaction. So, we have the cesium, we have initiated it in one of those substates, we can forget about the rest, and this is some structure of the excited state, so this is the optical transition, three times to the 14 hertz. So, this is where light goes. It's certainly out of scale, because this is like 10 gigahertz and this is 10 to the 14, but it doesn't matter. And um, in atomic optical physics, also in solid state physics actually, the widespread way of presenting the spins is to draw them on the so-called Bloch sphere. I don't know if you heard about it, but Okay. So um, this is the block sphere, and let's say that I have n atoms in my ensemble. And for my ensemble, n can be 100 million or 10 to the 12, it's really a lot. And if I optically prepare them all in one of those substates, that means that in the quantization axis like that, they are all oriented in one direction. So this is my macroscopic spin, which is equal to the spin projection of a single atom times the number of atoms. You should also remember, if you don't know, or if you know, you should recall, that three components of the spin, they obey a commutation relation. And the commutator, just to be sure that we understand it, is this kind of thing. So unlike numbers, operators cannot be swapped. And so this commutator is equal to the third projection of the spin. And now, Please find one difference between this expression and that one. So this is the commutator. So find the difference between this expression and what I have here. That's like one of your kids' games, right? Two pictures, find the difference. Yes. There is no hat on that one. 
And why is that? That's because this thing is a huge macroscopic number. So this Jx is equal to the number of atoms times the spin of a single atom, which in my case is 4. So. And if it's a large and classical value, then I can remove a head from it, and it simply becomes a number. Why is this important? This is important because now, if I look at this commutator, and I compare it with this commutator, which is just the commutator for the position and momentum of a particle, then I can convert this expression into this expression by simply dividing by the right-hand side. And I couldn't do it if it would be an operator, because dividing by an operator is not an innocent thing. So, if two operators don't commute, that means that there is an uncertainty relation connecting them. So, if there is a non-commuting pair of operators, then the product of their uncertainties should be greater than one half of the absolute value of the commutator. So, this is shown here. The minimal possible uncertainty for the direction of this spin in this direction and this direction will be approximately a square root of the number of particles. It's very similar, for example, if you heard of short noise of light, or it's very similar to the following. You all know that if you take a spin one half, you orient it like that, and then you project it on this axis. What would be the possible outcomes? Either minus one half or plus one half, right? Spin one half can only give you plus one half or minus one half. And now I do it a million times because I want to find the projection of the total spin in this direction. So one of them gives me one half minus one half, the other one gives me one half minus. It's a, it's a Poissonian distribution, it's a binomial distribution, which will have a mean of zero, right? <coughs> and the standard deviation of the order of square root of the number of coins that I toss. And this is exactly the quantum side of this story. That if I have a giant spin, and my spins are uncorrelated, this is important, then the uncertainty of this spin will be given, roughly speaking, by the square root of the number of spins times the square root of this number, doesn't it? So, what is this good for? In this lecture, it will be good for two reasons. One is that I should be able now to encode quantum states in the direction of the spin, because I have defined a nice quantum representation for it. So that should be good, for example, for teleportation, because I should be able to encode quantum states into the direction of the spin. I know the algebra, I'm fine. Another thing is that I should worry about this uncertainty if I want to make precision measurements. So imagine that I want to measure some magnetic field, some other field from the DC field that I apply. Magnetic fields tend to tilt spins. The most sensitive magnetometers, for example, you know, if you go and do MRI scan or something like that, they will measure the magnetic field of the nucleus in your body. But you cannot measure the direction of the spin to better than this uncertainty. So if you want to do quantum measurements, you have to start worrying about this uncertainty. And in the end of the day, hopefully, I will convince you that, in fact, this uncertainty, which looks like the basic quantum uncertainty, is actually not a limit. You can measure the direction of the spin 
with some nice conditions, almost as good as you can, as you wish. So, this condition that one of the spins is large and classical and always looks kind of along the direction of x axis means that this one and that one are the equivalent uh, relations. And that means that now if I zoom into this area of the block sphere, then it is equivalent to your favorite X and P representation of a particle, of an oscillator, or whatnot, canonical variables. So for your literacy, this transition from the spin picture like that to X and P like this is called the holstein primakov approximation. Well, anyway, holstein primakov approximation, which allows you to treat large spins just as X and P canonical variables. Is that kind of? Let me give you a counter example which hopefully will help you. Imagine that I start creating quantum states here. And when I create quantum states, for instance, by entangling those atoms, then from this state I can get all kinds of states, right? So imagine that I have started creating squeezed states. So a squeezed state will look like that. It has the reduced uncertainty in one direction and enhanced uncertainty in the other direction. If I keep squeezing it more and more and more, then maybe one at some stage I will start seeing the curvature of this space. And that would mean that I am going outside of the Holstein Primakov approximation. Why? Because if this thing becomes curved, then the length of this vector is not Jx anymore. It's reduced. And people have actually seen states not with 10 to the 8 atoms, but let's say with 10 to the 3 atoms, where the curvature is very significant and you go outside of this approximation. Which is also an interesting story, but not the story of today's lecture. Yes? And is it associated to the correlation between spins? To correlations, correlation between yes. Because if spins are uncorrelated, then all you can have is this. It's like with light. If you can have a coherent state of light, then you have shut noise. If you create correlations, then you can do whatever you wish. So a little bit more math here, since some of you are from the math department, I understand. As any X and P operators, you can present them as the sum of annihilation and creation operator for X, and the difference between the creation and annihilation operator for P. Those are just definitions. So, again, if you want to kind of read literature or maybe work in those representations, this is just like very important. You need to realize that there is this connection between the creation and annihilation operators and the canonical operators X and P. Why do we bother with those canonical operators? What's wrong with just creation and annihilation? The thing is that creation and annihilation operators are not Hermitian operators, right? If you take a Hermitian conjugate of B, you don't get B, you get B dagger. If you take a Hermitian conjugate of X, you get X. And the Hermitian conjugate of P is a P, and Hermitian operators can be measured. And this is what we love them for. We can measure them. So there are essentially two types of measurements in all this business. Either you count particles, and if you count particles, then you measure, of course, Oops. 
you measure this, right? Or you measure X and P, and then you can have the full tomography of the state and all the beauty. So what are those creation operators? How can we visualize them? What is, what is created here? So imagine that we start with this state, which is, look, which is like that one. The creation operator creates one single excitation in the whole sosum of those atoms. One collective excitation. So, boom, boom. And you shouldn't know which of the spins flipped. Because if you know which one flipped, that just simply means that you have reduced the length of this vector and you haven't changed anything with that one. And this is the state that you get. So if you are familiar with the harmonic oscillator and uh, with the number states, for instance, you know, you can have a ground state of the oscillator, you can have the first excited state, the second excited state. This is the X and P of the first excited state of the, of the oscillator. And uh, we can talk more about it, but we will not, because I don't think we have time for that. All right, so let's go for maybe another 10 minutes and then take a break. Um, They, we do experiments like that to create a single excitation. We take this ensemble, we scatter a single photon in such a way that we don't know which of the atoms scattered a photon, and we are looking for, for those things. Similar experiments have been done at MIT with Vlad and Vulitich, and, uh, but this is not what we want to do. What we want to do here at this lecture is to talk about the entangled state of two of those systems. And the entangled state is a cornerstone of all this quantum schmantum business. So if you want to publish some good journals, you deal with entangled states. The first kind of entangled state was seriously discussed by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. But before that, it was actually commented uh, by Schrodinger, who actually used to say that entanglement is the most fundamental feature of quantum mechanics. Uh, he spoke German, which I don't, and he used a different word, but then eventually it became Englishized, and now it's called entanglement. So, uh, yeah. The textbook example of two entangled particles. Entanglement obviously can come in different ways, right? So some of you, or maybe all of you, have attended uh, Joe Martinez's talks, and he was dealing with entanglement of the type of, I don't know what he did, 0, 1, 1, 0, or maybe plus, minus, minus 1 half, plus 1 half. So his entanglement was in a discrete variable state. When people talk about ions, for example, single trapped ions, they talk about discrete states because they have very limited number of particles. We have unlimited number of particles, and therefore for us, it is much better to discuss continuous variables. It doesn't mean that we cannot generate single excitations. We can but they would be embedded into the continuous phase space. So what was the story of EPR entanglement? Have you heard this story before? Some of you. Some haven't. <coughs> okay, but let, let me remind you, you know, what this is all about. So what those three gentlemen were saying was the following. Imagine that I have my particle described by this, and you have your particle described by that. And imagine that I am on this planet, and you are in a different constellation, God knows where. Or the other way around, if you feel to be here. So this is one operator, which is the distance. 
And this is the other operator, which is the sum of the momenta. Obviously, this operator and this one, they commute, right? You plug it in, cross terms cancel out, there is this minus, commutator is zero. If they commute, that means that I can measure that one and that one independently and simultaneously. If I can measure this, then I know it exactly. Okay, fine. So then, their argument was the following. If I now created a state like that, where I know exactly x1 minus x2 and p1 plus p2, then I can sit here and by my free will decide, I want to measure x. And I measure x1. And then I project your state into the eigenstate of x2. But on the other hand, I can change my mind in the last moment and say, I want to measure P. Then I will project your state into the eigenstate of the momentum. I cannot do both, of course, but at my free will, I can essentially affect the quantum state on the other side of the universe. And for Einstein, with his, you know, the no faster than light communication and causality, this was just nonsense. By now we have used to this, by now we say, well, you know, what does it mean we create a state like that? That means that we create a wave function which has, which describes a pure state and the size of this pure state and the size of the wave function, nobody limits it. The wave function can have the size of the galaxy in principle. How big is a photon? Have you ever thought of it? How big is a photon? A photon can be as big as this planet. So if I take, well, in fact, I'm pretty sure that the universe around us is filled with photons which are as big as, as a planetary system, right? Because a photon which comes from here, it will go and due to the diffraction principle, it will actually spread out. And when it travels a few thousand kilometers, this photon will be as big as you wish. So why can't a wave function be very large? And it can. And therefore, we can make a measurement on this wave function here and collapse its value into something very... So anyway, like, you know, you can get used to quantum mechanics, you cannot understand it. This is how Richard Feynman used to say, and I don't think we're smarter than him. So, this is the entangled state example. So, we pass through over the um, interpre questions of interpretation, and we just use this stuff. So, some 65 years later, uh, the group of uh, Sirac and Soller and also uh, Simon, they actually derived a necessary and sufficient condition for the entanglement of such two systems. So for Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, they just simply said, let's assume that this is known exactly and this is known exactly. But do you need to know things exactly? Nothing is exact in physics, right? There is always some uncertainty. So those people, they actually derived the condition that if I create a state where the variance of this operator plus the variance of this operator is less than one, then I can prove that this is an entangled state. And uh, why is it one and not pi squared times e? Well, it can be actually two sometimes. It depends on the, on the normalization. So, for instance, if, if I have a commutation relation of this kind, then, in fact, I can show that the variance of x will be one-fourth. 
And uh, did I do it right? I always mix up the, the factors of two. So this will be delta x times delta p greater or equal than one half. Actually, no. So for this uh, uh, con convention, it should be a two here. If I introduce those guys as like that, then it will be one fourth. And I can introduce x and p to within a factor of square root of two. This is in different books they use it. They use different notations. So what is important here is that if the two systems are independent, uncorrelated, and in the minimal uncertainty state, then this is a unity or equality sign. And if it's less than that, then they're entangled. So now we should try to connect the picture of the big collective spins that I told you about to this entanglement condition and see how we can generate an entangled state with such atomic ensembles. Let's go for five minutes more. Maybe. So, you've seen this Hamiltonian already and I explained to you how it works. For those of you who are mad about atomic physics, you can also note that there are things like tensor polarizability, vector polarizability. But for those of you who don't care about that, you should just remember that by changing the detuning of those fields from this level, or by using a suitable transition, I can tune those two coefficients. I can make them different, or I can make them the same. Imagine that I make them the same. So obviously I can rewrite that one through a, through a uh, product of P for light, P for atoms, X for light, X for atoms. And if those two coefficients are equal, then in fact it can be shown that I'm getting the Hamiltonian like that. And. Um, for spin one halves, it's always like this Hamiltonian, because for spin one half, this probability is equal to this probability, and therefore two coefficients are equal. So this Hamiltonian is a very famous one. It is called the quantum non-demolition Hamiltonian, and uh, this is another thing that you better know if you want to stay in this business. So let's look a little bit at the qualities of this thing. Oh, first, remember I told you that if I want to have very efficient interaction, quantum interaction, quantum interface between light and atomic ensembles, I need high optical depth. And this coefficient essentially describes you how strong the interaction is. And this coefficient is defined by the optical depth. And uh, I don't think I have time to go through all those details, but if you get this lecture, you can study it. So essentially, the coefficient squared can be described through the number of atoms, the atomic cross-section, and the cross-section of the atomic ensemble itself. And this, in fact, is the resonant optical depth. This thing here is the resonant optical depth. What is left here in this coefficient is the probability of spontaneous incoherent scattering. So I told you in the beginning that I want to avoid absorption of light 
and I want to avoid spontaneous emission because spontaneous emission and absorption they go hand in hand. The problem is that there is a theorem in physics which suggests that if I want strong dispersive interaction I must have some absorption. But it's easy to see here that if I want to have a certain large kappa coefficient, if my optical depth is very, very large, then I can afford to have a relatively small probability of spontaneous emission, right? So imagine that I want this to be 10. If optical depth is 100, then I can have the probability of spontaneous emission of one-tenth, which is relatively small. So this is why the optical depth is the rule of the game, the name of the game, with those kind of interactions. Let's look at some examples of the real physical systems. I told you that we need a lot of atomic spins. They should have large optical depth. And uh, what I didn't tell you, but I think what is kind of obvious, is that you want large coherence times of the atomic states, at least the lower two states. So one of the systems that we have been playing for a while with and are really happy with is actually room temperature gas. And um, the trick is here in the details. So this, this is our latest version of this room temperature gas. So it's kind of microfabricated system. This is the end of a channel which goes like that. And this is where atoms are. The rest is just the glass volume. And if you take a photo of those atoms from the side, this is what you see, so that's this channel. The thickness of the channel is about two to three hundred microns, really small, and the length is several millimeters or a centimeter. So with such a length, with cesium atoms at room temperature, you have about 10 to the 8 atoms and the optical depth can be really high. Now, what would be normally the problem with this? The problem will be that atoms will be bouncing back and forth from the walls of this channel, right? And typically, they will lose their spin state right away. We have a trick which allows us to keep those atoms in the intact quantum state despite the fact that they make zillions of collisions with walls. So that's one example. The other example is a little bit more exotic, I would say. So what you do is you take a fiber. Normally, the fiber with the core has the diameter of 150 microns. Then you heat the central part of this fiber and pull. And what you get, roughly speaking, looks like that, except for, of course, there are smooth boundaries. You pull it to the point that the central part becomes less than a micron, half a micron, 500 nanometers. Then what you get is, if you send light into the core of this fiber, it will go, 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 and then in this section, it will propagate as an evanescent wave. I don't know if you heard about it, but let me explain what it means. If you have, if you have glass and air, and you shine light like that, then if the angle is large enough, there will be called total internal reflection. But if you look carefully, you will actually see that there is a little bit of light in 
outside the glass at the distance which is something like of the order of the wavelength which is about half a micron this is called the evanescent wave and if you now do what I just told you then the evanescent wave will propagate for many millimeters just outside this fiber it's called the wave guiding and then with some smart techniques you put this all in vacuum and you can trap atoms around this nanofiber you trap them by sending two colors of light one above the atomic resonance one below the one above the atomic resonance uh, repels the atoms the one below attracts and you can have some balance so in the end of the day near the surface of this fiber you will have so this is meant to show the fiber this is meant to show the evanescent wave and those are those atoms they sit at the distance of 200 nanometers from the fiber and they form like a one-dimensional line of atoms a string of atoms and the beauty of it is that you can send light in and it will be very efficiently interacting with those atoms because the evanescent wave will just go 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 so this is I told you in the beginning that if you want to have an efficient interaction between light and atoms there are different ways to do it this is a new way to do it using the wave guiding properties of a nanofiber yes Yes. But then you, you I, I imagine what happens to your spontaneous emission in this configuration. Because if you, you cannot you cannot make sure you are not sure that all the photos that are still spontaneously emitted are going back to the fiber. So some of them will go with the fiber. If I could have them all going into the fiber, I would be the happiest man. Uh -huh. So you are absolutely right, but compared to free space the probability of a photon to go into the fiber is enormous like you know it can be five percent compared to the free space where it's 10 to minus six or whatever so you are totally right and you so it's this finite per cell factor right so uh, but what you do is exactly if you have a large number of atoms and if you position them at half wavelength from each other we've done this experiment actually it will be submitted very soon so very good question then they all interact collectively and then you can have a much higher probability of emitting into the fiber or on top of that and this is what people have done in the past you can embed mirrors here and here and then it becomes a cavity and then you can have a single atom guiding effect and so on. but uh, I will not be able to talk much about this system today we'll be mostly talking about that one but the point is that here you need 10 to the 8 atoms to make an efficient interface here you can have a few hundreds all right so let's look at this room temperature thing so imagine this is my channel so normally when atoms move around at every collision the spin can flip but there is this special spin preserving coating that people have known actually for 40 years or something and in colloquial language is just called paraffin you know you can make candles out of this thing and uh, we discovered that this thing works wonderfully well for protecting quantum states of the spins so atoms can experience up to a million collisions with a wall without changing their spin state without losing entanglement without losing superpositions really wonderful 
the way I kind of visualize it is that, you know, imagine spaghetti. So spaghetti molecules are like the molecules of this paraffin. And they are so long and neutral that cesium atoms don't have anybody to exchange the spin with. And therefore their spin state just stays there. So what happens in fact, they go into this coating, they bounce around a little bit and then they come out. So this is one of the large cells with which we started doing our experiments. It's really a big thing containing like 10 to the 12 atoms. Now, I told you in the beginning that all this ensemble business only works if atoms are indistinguishable in the sense that they all interact with light in such a way that you cannot tell which of those atoms has scattered this kind of photon. So what do you need for that? Well, you need in the best of the worlds that your light fills out almost the entire ensemble. Because if it doesn't, then maybe some atoms will not come back to the beam after the collisions. Finally, it's important that the length, the duration of the light pulse is longer than the time it takes for the atom to cross the beam. Because otherwise, again, the interaction will not be homogeneous. You can calculate that for a room temperature cesium atom, if this is like two centimeters, then it takes about 100 microseconds to cross once. So we like to have our pulses longer than that. For small cells that I showed you, you know, those little channels, the time to cross is about one microsecond, so you can work much faster. But you need this thermal averaging. One more thing is that we are playing with those kind of transitions, right? This is a strong field, this is the quantum field, and it's called actually Raman transitions in the literature. If you want your atoms to be indistinguishable, then you want the effective wavelength of this transition to be much longer than the size of the atomic sample. But that's easy because even for a gigahertz shifting, this is centimeters. And for magnetic splitting, which is a megahertz, this can be hundreds of meters. So this is not a problem. Yeah, so this is the close-up of the experimental system. All this surrounding is actually a very, very good magnetic shielding. Because I will show you that we can use this device for measuring magnetic fields which are like really tiny. This is one of the most sensitive magnetometers that people have. And it's as sensitive as the squid uh, superconducting magnetometers, but it works at room temperature. So that's good news for quantum technologies because we can offer some sort of application which is based on entangled atoms and all this stuff. So everybody likes it. Okay, entanglement. I told you that this is the condition for the entanglement. I also told you, I don't know if you remember still, but if you don't, I'll remind you. that for the atomic spins we can introduce the canonical apparatus like that. This is what I had at one of the slides. And the other projection used to introduce P. Using this, those things, 
I can convert this expression into this expression. What does this mean? This is, and, and yeah, very important. Very important is that when I will be dealing with the entanglement of two atomic ensembles, I will use ensembles where the macroscopic spins are oriented in opposite directions. This is really critical. If that one is oriented in this direction and that one is oriented in this direction, then for one of them I have Jx with the plus sign and for the other one I have Jx with the minus sign. And therefore one of those minuses is converted into pluses here. So what does this mean? This Jz1 plus Jz2 is the sum of projections of this spin on the z-axis and this spin on the z-axis. Actually those two z-axis should be parallel and I don't have them parallel. I'm sorry. <laughs> so it should, this should be z and this should be y. I apologize. Can I? So let's think a little bit. You have two vectors and I am talking now about the sum of the projections in the z-axis and the sum of the projections in the y-axis. So let's assume that this variance is zero and this variance is zero, right? Then they are very strongly entangled. What does it mean? It means that I know exactly this sum and this sum. That means that I know exactly the angle between those two vectors. Because I know the projection on the z and I know the projection on the y. And because they are oppositely oriented, then knowing the sum of the projections means knowing the angle. So if this angle, for instance, if the angle is... In quantum physics, if something is known, you can always put it to zero. <laughs> well, really. If, if I know the value, I can write it on a piece of paper and then use my knowledge later on. Or I can apply a feedback to the system and just, you know, if I measure the angle between those two vectors, which is, let's say, 10 to minus 3, I apply a little classical torque and I make it zero. So all that is to tell you that the entangled state of those two spins actually means, visually, that those two spins are more parallel than Heisenberg uncertainty allows you to know one of them. Once again, if I have a single spin, its uncertainty is this standard quantum uncertainty that I talked about, square root of n of the number of particles. It can only be bigger than that. But if I create an entangled state, then I can create a state where they will be exactly parallel. The price will be that, as you probably know, if I take one half of the entangled state, then it will be a very, very chaotic state. Because an entangled state is a pure state. If I take one half of a pure state, I get very, very mixed state. Well, I'm not going to prove it here and now, but you should just simply trust me. One, one simple example actually is from the discrete variable story, right? So the textbook example A textbook example of an entangled state is a state like that, right? This is an entangled state. So you do like that, that means yes? Oh, wow. Uh -huh. And this means no? Do you have like, you know, the schizophrenic splitting of your... <laughs> Because, you know, some people do this and some people do that. 
<laughs> so that depends on where, where you grow up. Okay, it's me. So the, like, the circularly polarized. Anyway, so if this is an entangled state, and I only look at one half of it, let's say only at this half, then obviously I will get randomly either 0 or 1. Is that clear? So one half of an entangled state is always a mixed state. In the same fashion, if I know that the two vectors are parallel because they're entangled, then each of them will actually be in very uncertain state. So it's like a superposition of many anti-parallel directions. This is how you should visualize an entangled state of those two spins. A superposition of many continuous anti-parallel directions. And uh, already here you can appreciate that if I have entangled states like that, then I can measure tiny magnetic forces on them. Because if I know exactly the angle between them and I expose one of them to a tiny magnetic perturbation, then I can measure this perturbation because it will change this angle. And then if I know exactly that they were parallel, then I will measure the angle with arbitrary accuracy. So that's sort of the essence of the entanglement assisted magnetometry. Except for, I say, arbitrary accuracy, it's not going to be arbitrary. But my standard quantum limit is square root of the number of particles, right? So in the angle terms, right, if this is square root of n and this is n, then the angular uncertainty is 1 over square root of n. So this is the standard quantum limit. With entanglement method, I can measure almost down to 1 over n. And if n is 10 to the 8, there is a lot of improvement. Of course, nobody has ever seen anything in anywhere close to that. Okay, so a little bit more <laughs> experimental meat into it. How do you actually do all those experiments? What do you measure? What do you get? So this is one atomic ensemble. I put it in the magnetic field. This is my macroscopic spin direction, right? In the previous pictures it was horizontal, now let's make it vertical. If my classical spin would be vertical and I would put a magnetic field along this spin, nothing will happen precisely. But in quantum physics I always have those little quantum uncertainties. And those little quantum uncertainties begin to now precess. And this is very useful. So, you now take linearly polarized light, this light, and you send it through this ensemble. Okay, so I actually told you that what happens is scattering of photons in the orthogonal polarization, which would mean that polarization of light will change. Now, for those of you who had some atomic physics in the past, you can associate it with the so-called Faraday effect. So Faraday effect suggests that if you have a projection of the spin on the direction of propagation of light, then light polarization will rotate. And if the projection is this direction, then light polarization will rotate this way. And if this projection oscillates, then light polarization will oscillate. It will go through and oscillate. And this is what I see here. So I send light which is linearly polarized like that. It goes through and because of the 
photons scattered in the other polarization, I have rotation of polarization and it oscillates at the frequency of spin polarization rotation. It's called in atomic physics sometimes Larmor frequency or Zeeman frequency. If I now measure the polarization rotation and I can do it with some polarizers and optics, I will have a photocurrent and this photocurrent will oscillate at the frequency of the spin rotation. What I measure is the projection of the spin in the laboratory frame on this axis because this is the Faraday effect. I can write it as the Jz projection in the rotating frame times cosine omega t minus Jy in the rotating frame times sine omega t. And it's those Jz and Jy's in the rotating frame which are my quantum variables. This is what I'm going to entangle and this is what I'm going to use to encode quantum information. Just, just, just a question. I, I don't have sensitivity for this number to have no spin, but how sure can you be that the temperature is not affecting the, the dispersion, so say, so the uncertainty of your of your spin? Right. How can it be? Well temperature does not affect it all. You don't have Doppler problem, Doppler problem. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so several things. Let's take them one by one. Doppler broadening. Doppler broadening is eliminated because I use the detuning which was much greater than Doppler. That's one thing. The motion and, you know, of course, in principle, when they move around, then they move through the light beam and they will have slightly different interaction time and interaction strength. But remember, I do it long enough so that I have this motional leveraging. Finally, the walls are coated so that the spins don't change. So that, that's all kind of in one box. Okay. So you take this photocurrent, you use a thing called locking amplifier, which is a box, which you can buy for money, which will split the cosine omega t and sine omega t components and put them here and here. This component will tell you about this projection, this component will tell you about this projection. Well, those two projections don't commute. Therefore, I will not be able to measure them without changing them. There will be the so-called back action of the measurement which comes, in other words, from the entanglement of this light with those atoms. But if now I add the second one, why doesn't it rotate? It should rotate. Okay. So now I have two of them. And note that one of them is oppositely oriented to the other one. The magnetic field is in the same direction. So they do like that. Now what I measure here is the sum of Z1 and Z2 and Y1 and Y2. And this operator commutes with this operator because Jx1 is equal to minus Jx2. Right? So I have two spins, one has Jx, the other one has minus Jx, right, as shown there. Therefore, Jz1 plus Jz2 commutes with Jy1 plus Jy2. Therefore, this measurement will be quantum mechanically possible and I can measure those things without disturbing them. And if I can measure them, that means that I know them exactly, that means that I create an entangled state because an entangled state is the state where I know exactly or very well those two. So think of it in the following way. 
I have those two spins, I send light through, and I get two numbers out of it. One in this channel, one in this channel. Those numbers tell me about the angle between, angle between those two spins in the rotating frame in the z and in the y direction. And because those two commute, I can get those two numbers without changing the variables. And that means that I have entangled them. It means that I know the angle between those two spins better than for uncorrelated particles. So, uh, beyond that, all I can suggest to you is to read the literature and see where this is derived in all the glory. Um, a few years ago, we have written the Review of Modern Physics, 50 pages. So, you can enjoy this reading. Say it again. For the one photon. One photon. Well, I don't deal with one photons here. I don't deal with single photons here. I actually measure, like you know, the polarization rotation of a strong beam. Yes, I mean you. For one ensemble, you mean? No. Yes. In the scenario, you measure J Z one. Oh, I see. Okay. This one. Yes. So if I here only measure like that, then I will get two outputs here. Yes, but uh, I will disturb the spins. And actually in the seminar lecture at 3 o'clock, 3 o'clock, right? 2 o'clock. In the seminar lecture, I will explain this in more detail and actually show how this works exactly. But in principle, if you make a continuous measurement of the single oscillating spin, then you pile up the back action of the measurement both here and here. So it's like, imagine, so my light goes this way, the spin is rotating like that. So at this point, I measure this projection and I put the back action in that projection. But then it rotates. And now I'm measuring the projection where I put the back action before and put the back action in the other one. And it just grows and grows. Yeah, this is just sort of to explain how this measurement is done you send the linearly polarized light, your quantum fields are in this direction, and you use 45 degree polarizing beam splitter to make the measurement of the photocurrent in this polarization and this polarization. So, a little bit more math on how this works. So, I have one atomic ensemble, another atomic ensemble, and this is my Hamiltonian. If I apply this Hamiltonian to this interaction, then I get that. So P of light and P of atoms commute with the Hamiltonian and therefore are conserved. If I want to calculate X of the first pulse of light. If I want to calculate X of light, then I just do my Schrodinger equation calculation, right? X is some coefficient times, sorry, the, the Hamiltonian is P of light, sorry, 
P of atoms, X of light. P of atoms commutes with this one, I pull it out. The, Hamiltonian, the commutator of P of L and X of L is minus I. So what I get is something like that. P of atoms is a constant of motion, right? It commutes with the Hamiltonian, which means that I have the derivative dark shift which is imposed by quantum fluctuations of this beam will disturb your atomic spin. And this is exactly the mechanism for the back action of light acting on atoms. And this means that the uncertainty of your state grows. This is essentially another way to represent why when I do continuous measurement on my rotating spin, I have more and more and more of this back action. So the longer this interaction happens, the bigger is the uncertainty of the single spin. Now, if I have now the other spin, and this is now the south pole, because they are oriented oppositely. And they are oriented oppositely here. Now, it's the same light which I sent through here. And now watch what's happening here. This one is also dark shifted. By the same amount as here, but the spins are flipped. And those two effects, they have exactly opposite side. Therefore, this one also becomes uncertain. But they are correlated. So you see those vectors, but remember that they are oppositely oriented. So if this one is shifted that way and this one is shifted that way, then nothing changes actually. They, they are still, they were parallel and they are parallel, right? If they were like that and they are shifted like this, by the same amount, they are still parallel. You don't know in which direction they are shifted because it's quantum fluctuations, but it's the same for quantum fluctuations here and here. So this is the physics of this entanglement interaction. And it's very important that here we have positive mass oscillator and here we have negative mass oscillator. And uh, this is the result which is kind of ancient by now. Here we do exactly what I just told you and we measure the quantum uncertainty of this sum and this sum and we need it to be below 1 because this is the entanglement criterion and it is below 1. So this was the first demonstration of the entangled state of two microscopic objects back in 2001 and uh, since then we've done a lot of things for which we don't have much time. Um, yeah, that's the teleportation experiment in 2006. Yeah, for that one we don't have time at all, but uh, if you are interested, entanglement can also be generated not by measurement, by, by the engineered dissipation. Typically, dissipation is an enemy of entanglement. But if you engineer the dissipation bath in the right way, if you make the dissipation channel common for two systems, then entanglement actually can be generated as a result of this dissipation process. And in this way, entanglement will be just kept for as long as electricity runs in the lab. So it's kind of a little bit counterintuitive because we know that typically entangled states are very fragile and you cannot maintain them for a long time. Here we actually maintained it, you know, for an hour and then we turned it off. It is a little bit of illusion. I don't want to say cheating because it's not cheating. But there is a big difference between the entanglement 
which survives for one second without you doing anything and the entanglement which survives for one second because you force it to be entangled. The difference from practical perspective is that imagine that I want to use entanglement for precision measurements. So I entangle and then I step out and then I impose some classical disturbance which I want to measure. That works fine. I, I create an entangled state, I provide the disturbance, I come back, I measure, I measure my disturbance. If I use this approach, then the state will be always kept entangled and if you provide some disturbance to one of the systems, this disturbance will be crashed because the state will be driven to the entangled state, never mind what the disturbance you apply. So this kind of thing has its own advantages and disadvantages and uh, the message here is simply that it's fascinating that you can keep your entangled system entangled forever, we call it entanglement forever, but it's not the recipe against all diseases. Yeah. No time for that. Um, I think I will stop here and then I will look at my seminar and we will see how we can massage the material there so that we get the most out of the seminar too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Plenty of questions, yeah, I'm quite satisfied. And uh, we can talk over lunch or after lunch or whatnot. Okay, well, thank you very much once again. Sure.